Um, hi, my name is Christine Harad. Hi, my name is Rainy Small. Hello, my name is Azaria Garris. Hi, my name is Bayer Robinson. Hi, my name is Zaya Backhues. And this podcast is on Tan's Labyrinth. So I guess I could start and talk about the camera editing. Um, one thing I noticed from the beginning is that they have a lot of panning. So the camera follows where the characters are going and it actually shows who, what the character sees, who the character's talking to, where they're going, and it kind of follows the character around. So the movie overall is like a fairy tale. It's a story, so I feel like it, the panning and the camera angles really fed into it being a story being told and it kind of taking the um, person who's watching the movie into this new world kind of, if that makes any sense. I agree and like one other thing I noticed specifically about like the um editing I guess was like they didn't really cut out the gory parts like they showed exactly when like the captain um like I think the first person that he killed was like those two farmers and like he really should know Marcy and like I think it was interesting that they didn't really try to like hide the gory parts in the movie that really heightened it. It added to like the war effect of it. I was thinking that same thing with the the gory parts. I was surprised that they were showing everything that was happening when they were shooting them, when the doctor was cutting off the guy's leg. It was just, it was a little intense, but like you said, it adds to that war effect. Yeah, that's probably why I think the movie's rated R or something like that. But they, the camera angles really add on to the um, storytelling and it really showed the watcher everything that was going on. So I guess I could talk about uh, the music now and how that kind of helped aid in showing like the nightmarish qualities of the movie. Um, so the film was composed by Javier Navarrete. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And the music definitely helped tell the story. So like in the beginning, the music was definitely more like cutesy, I guess. It kind of helped portray this kind of fairy tale, whimsical, childish lullaby type of music. And then all of a sudden, it has like this ominous tone to it. And it adds to that, like, oh, this is not, like, about a fairy tale, really. It's, like, a nightmare. Um, so the first song is called Long, Long Time Ago, and it was basically a lullaby. And then towards, like, the middle um, of the film, he starts adding this, like, string orchestra and this percussion that helps make it kind of scary in a way. So there's this song called um, Not Human, that's kind of in the middle of the film. And that is like a very eerie piece. So I feel like the music was very important in this film because it turned from cute, childish to like, what is this, like really quickly, so. Yeah, I would agree um, with the music being very ominous. It stood out to me and I, I realized that a lot of the movie, they had music playing in the background. It wasn't like too overwhelming though. It was kind of like background noise, but not really. So it still had an impact on our psyche in a way. Um, on that note, I can move on to the settings and costume. The settings, it took place in Spain um when they're on they're in the country kind of like a rural a rural setting uh kind of farm like the house looks very old um and wooden and they dress like they're in the 1920s in Europe the car that they in the opening scene that also resembles a car that was from the 1920s um and then the, the other setting is the underworld the creatures' costumes were very strange or fiction. They were folktale, but not like a PG fairy tale. So in the opening scene when they were talking about um, the princess, 
I did expect it to be kind of more like a beautiful PG, very well lit type of fairy tale. But as the movie goes on, you see that it's different. Like um, the previous person said, it's more so like a nightmare type of folk tale. And then the servants and the cooks are dressed less sophisticated. Um, they have a lot of dull colored, colored clothing. Um, and they also have a lot of, I would say like wool kind of cotton type of clothing. So it may be colder there. And then when um, Ophelia is wearing the green dress before the dinner party, she puts it up high for it to not get dirty to please her mother. But once she comes out, it still ends up getting very dirty, very muddy. And I think that may signify that, um, that that's not the life that she's that she was meant to live. And then lastly, in the end scene, when she uh, reunites with her father, the king, they're all dressed very sophisticated. The clothing is brightly lit. The colors are red and gold, um, just to signify royalty. Um, sorry, just to like piggyback off what you were saying, I guess. I was gonna ask, did anyone else notice that like, for almost the entire film, Ophelia only wore green and white. Like every outfit that she changed into was like green and white or like all white or like really earthy tones. And um, <clears throat> when you were saying, um, Azaria, that like when she hung up the dress, it kind of like signified that like she, that's not the life that she wanted for herself. And I was thinking like when she, like put up the her green and white dress she had on like another like a more natural green dress that and like by the end of that scene with the frog she was pretty much covered in mud and everything and she looked like just very like earthy like she um I think the green in my opinion the green and white like for her character um pretty much like connected her to the underworld because like she always wore like earthy tunes and she kind of like matched the fawn and the fairies. Like she pretty much just blended in with the natural environment, which I thought was clever. I would agree. I noticed that as well. And also how the captains and his soldiers wore blue most of the movie. Um, different, well, usually their uniform. And then um, towards the end when he's just in his button down shirt it's kind of a shade of blue yeah and even like with the captain um like his for the entire movie he's like very well put together well groomed um he always has on his uniform or like when he's not grooming but um towards the end like after he's stabbed he's just wearing like the blue shirt not his jacket not his hat just the bloody blue shirt. And I think that like, that was the first point where he started to show weakness, real weakness. Yeah, I thought that was interesting how the entire movie, the entire film, he was put together and well kept, but towards the ending when like things started to fall out of his grasp and like the the men of the woods started to, um push them a little harder like he became unraveled because he knew in a way like defeat was approaching some way somehow yeah and that makes sense for Ophelia to be wearing green and white because it says that green represents um it's associated with nature and it also is the color of spring which represents rebirth and I guess her finding her way back to her underworld kingdom after going into the light and dying shows some sense of rebirth so I thought that made sense. Yeah, and um, like even, I guess, after her rebirth, like like I said, like for the entire film, she was wearing green and white until the end. She appears in red and yellow. And like that's, those are her royal colors. And I would also like to add that what stuck out to me was the way Ophelia's mother dressed, um, considering that she was the wife of the captain i expected her to be dressed more sophisticated and well put together like he was but most of the movies she wasn't she was dressed very similar to the servants and the cooks 
I agree. That was something that I also like noticed. Cause I was like, why is Ophelia like dressed better than her mom? But I I guess I just like summed it up to like her being her in her condition. And I also noticed that the mom, like throughout the film, she kind of progress um progress, I guess, because she went from walking into in the beginning and then like when she met the captain or I guess reunited with the captain. She immediately went to a wheelchair, and then after the wheelchair, she was um, on bed rest, and then she died. And so that was like nice. I guess that was like a part of her costume, maybe. But like that was nice to see her regression. Yeah, I thought her regression was really, really interesting, but sad at the same time because like from the beginning, um, Ophelia is like you know in her in her world of books and you know in her fantasy land and like everybody around her especially her mom is like emphasizing like where we're going you're not going to need that like you need to stop believing in magic because it's not real and things like that and she was really just trying to please the captain and making sure that Ophelia like obeyed him so nothing could go wrong but like as she was just blindly doing that that was hurting her more than helping her or her daughter, anyone, because the captain didn't, it looked like he didn't even care about her mom, just the fact that she was carrying his child and it needed to be born because it was going to be his first son. And that was like the most important thing to him. That and like, you know, his stance in the war, his position, power. But I guess I can talk about the script um I don't really know what to say for the script honestly Azaria you said you like analyzed the dialogue and I feel like a lot of times um it was like a hierarchy throughout the entire movie of like you know when when people were speaking or they would only speak when they were spoken to they were obeying a command because I feel like whenever the captain talked he was just spewing out orders for people to follow, whether it be his soldiers, you know, the enemy, the wife, Ophelia, or, um, I just completely forgot something. Or Mercedes, yes, yes. Like, everybody would just tell him, yes, yes, okay, okay, of course, yes. And even like the fawn, when Ophelia and the fawn would have their interactions, he would be telling her what to do. Like, you have to complete this task. You must obey this, 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 this. And she was like, okay, okay, okay. So I felt like it was just pretty much, I don't know how to describe that kind of dialogue. And, and to me, it just seems like there was a hierarchy throughout the entire movie that was shown through the dialogue I, people talk. Sorry. No, I was saying, like, I definitely agree with you, and I noticed, like, this same thing. I was going to, like, add the, um, that last part that you added about how the fawn, like, his behavior, like, his way of manipulation was kind of, like, similar to um, Captain Vidal, like, in the, because um, I guess it's, like, a contrast between these two worlds, like, the mythical world and, like, this war world that's going on. And in the war world, it was like Captain Vidal, who was, like you said, he was always giving out orders and everyone else just blindly obeyed. And then in the like mythological world, it was the fawn who like, he seemed like, obviously he seemed nicer than Captain Vidal, but like he was still manipulative. Like he still, he only, he was only nice as long as Ophelia was obeying him. Exactly, exactly. And even though he seemed nice, he was still very firm, like in his delivery. And when she didn't, um, you know, follow that second task of not eating anything, he was like, you can never return. He just got so mad. And it was similar to how the captain, you know, when someone wouldn't obey him or would talk out of line, they would die. It, it, it's more of like an extreme in the real world, but it was kind of similar. Like he would, he would get upset and as a consequence, someone would lose their life or be badly injured. Right. Yeah, I agree. I, um, I guess I can move on to um, acting and casting, actors and casting, sorry. Um, 
the casting for this movie, um, from my research, was Del Toro himself. Um, the actor for, um, that was the main actress, Ophelia, she was the only child for the majority of the film until the baby was born, which, um, which I found interesting. I was like, I feel like for the major first half of the film, I was like looking for other kids, but it was just her. Um, and apparently like Del Toro himself said that like he was actually looking for someone younger, but um, the actress Ivana Beccaro, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, she was 11 or 10 at the time. And um, he actually altered the script to match, to better suit her age. Um, and he did this because she just gave a magnificent audition and like he had no choice. Um, but yeah, I thought her performance was incredible for this. Um, and I think like he made the right choice with altering the, the script a little because um, like with a younger character, in my opinion, the war scenes would be too gruesome to um, like even in contrast to the mythological scenes. I just feel like it would be too gruesome for a younger child to participate. It would, be, it would seem inappropriate. Um, the next, Captain Vidal, was played by Sergi Lopez, um, who before this film was known as like a melodramatic or like comedic actor in Spain. Um, and so this was his first real um, serious, I guess, role. Um, and I think he played it well. He played a sociopath or psychopathic, um, very militant, very well-groomed man. Um, who expresses little emotion except when torturing people. Um, and I think his character adds to the psychological impact of the film because like he brings all of the violence and his character was actually inspired after um, Francesco Franco, who was a Spanish general in the 1940s and he was also a dictator. Um, the fawn, and the Pale Man um, were both played by the same actor, actually. His name was Doug Jones. His name is Doug Jones. Um, and I thought that was very interesting to me to know that these were played by two different people. I mean, these two characters were played by the same person, sorry. Um, just because I felt like they were two very different creatures. Like the, um, the fawn was the guide to the underworld and he was, somewhat manipulative, but like his character came off as someone that you couldn't trust, but like you should trust anyway, I don't know. Um, yeah, and the pale man was just scary, really. <laughs> um, the other actress is Carmen, the mom, Ophelia's mom is played by Aridna Gill. Um, Dr. Ferreira was played by Alex Angulo. Um, Garces, Vidal's lieutenant, um, was played by Manolo Solo. Um, and yeah, that's all I have, I think. I, I think that these actors, especially um, the younger actress who played Ophelia, I think they played their, their roles really well and delivered um, exactly what they were supposed to do. I definitely agree. Uh, I think everybody has did their part, but the one that's left is psychological impact. And I know you had touched on that um, a little when you were explaining the actors. So if you wanted to add in something about it or anyone else, I don't really have anything to add if you guys don't, but um, I have a question for you guys. Um, like, I really enjoyed the film. I, I don't typically enjoy these type of films, but I was like glued to the screen. Um, but one thing that kind of like confused me was that towards the end, like Ophelia's mom and dad and little brother were all in the underworld, like waiting for her. But while Ophelia's mom was alive, 
she kind of gave me like the impression that like she wouldn't like she had nothing to do with it like she didn't believe in any of it and so like the ending kind of confused me what about you guys yeah i was i was surprised to see her mom and brother down there as well because it would they the fawn was only talking about her father her father her father and how she was a princess um i feel like the mom only suppressed all of that down like on earth just to protect herself and to protect her daughter i felt like she, if she fed into that even just a little like it would just cause a lot more tension and way more problems than they were already facing being in the presence of um fidel i guess so i guess yeah but like i feel like del toro still should have gave us like a little hint that she knew anything like i i had no idea that she even knew anything about it like i feel like he could have hinted that she had something to do with it but like that she didn't want um that she was trying to protect Ophelia but I just didn't get that vibe at all um I kind of can take a different approach to it in the beginning when Ophelia is reading the story the fairy tale story they talk about how the princess escaped and how it was many many years that went by and her father was just hoping that at least her soul would return He's the background, I'm sorry. Um, so I think that in a way, it may still be fiction and this didn't really happen. Of course, not in real life, but this may be Ophelia's imagination just for her to escape her scenario, her lifestyle, um, just to escape her stepfather. Maybe having that one last vision or imagination of her mother and her brother escaping from her stepfather and actually living a better life in the underworld maybe that was Ophelia's last hope or last wish before she passed away that's just that's kind of what I'm thinking Mika. and see like I would agree with you but like there were certain times throughout the plot I mean throughout the um throughout the movie where like the two worlds collided. And so it makes you think, or it made me think at least, that like it wasn't just in her imagination, that it was actually real. Like, um, for example, like when she, when she was running at the end with the baby um, through the labyrinth and like she had reached the dead end, but the walls magically opened up for her and then like closed behind her. Like her stepdad was in that, scene so it kind of made me think like this has to be real like not just her imagination and also i think the um the chalk door when mercedes came back and she saw the chalk on the wall but i don't know yeah i understand um azaria's perspective and i i i can agree with her but i also i can understand where you're coming from like i'm not sure which which side to really stand on yeah maybe it was a mix of both maybe um her mother the soul of her mother in her former life took the place of her mother in the present life i'm not sure it could be either way probably up to interpretation to the audience that's probably what he wanted to do But I do think he could have developed like a couple more characters and their background just a little more because I feel like there were definitely a lot of just blanks and like things that you were left wondering about certain scenes and certain characters. I agree, but I would still give I would still give it like a nine out of ten. What about you guys? I'd give it like an eight, nine. Yeah, I'd have to give it maybe an eight for that. But it was really good. I did enjoy the film. I'd give it an 8.5 out of 10. I'd give it an eight. 
So it would be overall see that there wasn't really a psychological impact to it. I mean, I don't want to say that there isn't. I I found something online where it said like the theme of the the movie was supposed to be good versus bad versus innocence, and that like in a place of war, there's no, there's like in a war zone, there's no place for innocence, which is why. Ophelia died because like her innocence is what killed her and then the guy Vidal he was like a dictator or whatever so he died obviously and he he was supposed to represent like uh the guy Franco like a fascist leader type of leader fighting a democratic um force which was the men in the woods who I think in the end one because of the ending but that's all I really have I would agree with that theme because there were a lot of unnecessary deaths um especially just started from the beginning when he killed the two farmers and it actually did turn out that they were hunting rabbits and then I also thought about how that affected the two daughters that he was getting the food for the sick daughters um so even just that like you said all the innocence is being affected in a war during a war um and also the mother dying from childbirth um that is that was common during that time but still it was a unnecessary death and then also the doctor dying it was just a lot of unnecessary deaths Sorry, I actually do have something about the psychological impact. This is gonna be really long, but um, I'll make it quick. The um, do you guys remember the scene with like the pale man and how Ophelia ate the grapes despite being told more than once, despite being told that her life depends on it. She ate the grapes, and like that's what with the man not. But I like in research, I found out that <laughs> in research, I found out that. This scene actually, like, um, it kind of, like, I don't, I don't want to say pays tribute, but it kind of, like, pays tribute, um, is evocative of the time, like, the time that the movie was set, 1940s Spain, um, post-war, um, in a dictatorial, like, state. Um, like, during that time, a lot of families, like, it was like a food um, scarcity. And so a lot of families like struggled to find food. And so this scene, like with all that food, like a great feast, it would be almost impossible for a child in that time to be able to like ignore the feast. And that's how the pale man was able to trap the kids. And so I think just adding that like little detail in the, um, in that scene, not one scene, like that definitely is to the psychological impact because it allows the, audience to really connect to the not only the characters but the people that those um that this story was based on and honestly that makes so much sense because even though i was so upset that she ate the grapes and it was only two like it's the fact that she only ate two and picked grapes out of everything to eat i'm like really before you went in there you say you said the rules and one of the rules was don't eat or drink anything you're doing so well, and then you eat two grapes, like, that's it, but it makes sense that your explanation makes sense, because even though she was the stepdaughter to the captain, and they were eating well, since she was away in the, uh, doing her first task, and came back all muddy, her mom said she wasn't getting any supper, which I thought was just interesting, like, we didn't see her eat the whole film, and during that feast, they were talking about how they were gonna ration the food off to the families and like they could only get a certain amount of food if they had those little cards. I just thought the whole thing was interesting, especially during the fact that they were dictating how other families were going to eat and survive while having this huge feast. And you know, they were eating food that he stole from two farmers, two innocent farmers that he killed. The whole thing was just very interesting. A lot of satire there. I agree. When you know like the history or the context behind the film, 
like it just makes so much more sense like you're able to connect everything and it just it's it makes for a better viewing experience but any last words guys no i'm all good i think this was a really a really good movie and a really nice discussion i agree I agree. Um, so with that being said, thank you for listening to our podcast. Thank you very much.